Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome, uh, a lovely Friday morning. And as you can see, I'm not in my studio this morning. So this is the second time that we've taken this on the road and doing it off site or from a different location. And uh, I do feel a little bit out of my depth. It's amazing when you change your environment, how different things can feel and things that usually go like step by step is suddenly, okay, where are we going with this? But anyway, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that the sound is okay. Um, as you can see, I look like a news reporter this morning. I just need the little cube thing here in the front and then uh, I'll, I'll be exactly <laughs> what I need to be. But uh, yeah, this morning we're really excited. We've got David Cobb back from the FBI doing the news. Got Norma talking about some personal development. And then also Indra Crawford doing the financial coaching segment for us this morning. So thank you to all three of you. And uh, without any further ado, oh, by the way, so I'm going to be talking about seven, I'm going to share seven books with you that will have a great and just amazing positive impact on your life. So really looking forward to sharing that with you. I'm also going to ask you to share your some of your books that have had a positive impact on your life so others can see what other uh, sources there are out there. Somebody shared, uh, I think it was David LaRue, who shared on, on LinkedIn yesterday seven books or quite a few books. And uh, one of those are on my list today. Six others I haven't read before. So that's very valuable. So without that or with that, let's go to the new studio with David Kopp. David, sorry, just unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. Um, so I did the cardinal mistake of 2020 and didn't unmute myself. So apologies for that. Um, so yeah, from this uh, brisk winter morning um, and uh, realizing that I need to get some more lighting for doing early morning shows, um, let's get on with the news. So in the first one, the FSCA on the 5th of May has released the draft notice for levies on financial institutions under the Financial Services Board Act and the financial sector regulations. Um, there is a commentary period that is open until the 17th of June. Uh, so these are obviously the levies that will be payable for the next levy period. Um, FBI will obviously be putting a, a response together on that. Then also on the 5th of May, uh, the FBI released the results of its professional competency exam um, that was written earlier this year. Uh, it was after a robust assessment process stretching over a period of eight weeks that takes into consideration the principles of fair assessment as well as the FBI's PCE policy. Um, we are satisfied that the candidates who were found competent meet the education and examination standards of the FBI. So the pass rate for the March 2021 uh, CFP professional PCE competency exam was 46% uh, with the pass mark being 60%. So while the growth of professional membership is important, it is vital that the FBI keeps the global professional financial planning standards for the benefit of the public at large and only awarding the CFP professional designation to candidates who meet these world-class certification standards. Then in the general news, um, are you the Judeans people front? The server asks, to which uh, the response is, uh, can't be repeated on the news, but essentially it says, go away, we are the people's front of Judea. So this was reported in the moneymarketing.co.uk. And while this quote comes from Monty Python's life of Prime from about 40 years ago, it is still very relevant in our industry and our profession today. And the article was really going on about the use of titles and the debate that while many professions titles are protected in law, it is not so for financial advisors and financial planners. Um, what is interesting, this matter was, was extensively covered in the FSCA's advisor categorization paper, and it appears that South Africa is not the only territory that is actually struggling with this issue of what to call ourselves. The debate is less around the name that we want to use and more around does it reflect the level of qualification and experience and professionalism? And if the titles are not protected in law and anyone can call themselves a financial planner or financial advisor, what value does the title have? So while it seems the UK community is starting this debate, um, in Canada and South Africa, that debate has already moved on into the regulatory space with regards to protection of titles. 
And then uh, as a closing segment for your dinner party, if you go into dark room, complete absence of light, you would think that you see nothing. Apparently what you see is a color called um, Eigengrau. Uh, so Eigengrau or dark light is a color seen by the eye in perfect darkness. So even in the action of light, some action potentials are still sent along to the optic nerve, causing the sensation of a uniform dark gray color. So if you go into a, a totally dark room in the absence of light, the color that you will see is called Eigengrau. So there's a new word to add uh, to your repertoire. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Awesome, David. Uh, I also want to add that uh, now we in South Africa, we don't call it Eigengrau, if I've got that correct. It's called the David. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, <laughs> a completely dark room, <laughs> and that works as well. So thank you very much. Amazing. Have a fantastic weekend, and we'll see uh, you back next week. Perfect. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. So yeah, sorry for uh, if you see me ducking down. It's because the laptop is down. Yeah, as I said, I'm like out, not in my groove this morning. But somebody who is in a group is Norma Simons. And uh, over to her for some personal development. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be back. So today we're talking about living with integrity and how important it is in personal development. So we're going to look at what it means, um, how we can get closer to living with integrity, and then looking at why it is important. So let's start off by looking at the meaning. So integrity comes from the Latin word integritas, which means to be whole or to be complete. So integrity is also related to the word integrate, which means um, that we bring something together. So in this case, we're bringing together our inner life and our outer life. Uh, so for every day in everyday life, integrity looks like us bringing together our words and our actions that reflect who we believe we really are. Okay, so um, we bring together um, basically what, what, what we bring to the table. So Martha, Martha Beck has a quite a nice way of, of stating what integrity really is. So she's saying that we're living in alignment with our true nature. So that would mean bringing our mind, body and spirit um, in alignment. So there's a, a therapist by the name of Bob Tabit that has a very nice way of explaining exactly what integrity is. And um, he does it in two ways. So he's, he, he takes step one, which is really to look at our inner life. And then step two would be uh, to take our actions and then align it to our inner life. So let's uh, look at, at the inner life first. So inner life is really then referring to our uniqueness, to our gifts, and how we can basically then share that with the world. So we would look at our purpose and see exactly sort of wh why we are here. So wh why were we put on this earth? So for some, it might be to, to impact the world. For some, it might be just to leave a legacy. So we have to also identify our values and, and then create a vision for ourselves. So we can, we can see and, and, and notice what's important to us, but it's quite important to, to be quite specific about it. So if we say, for instance, that family is important to us, then we need to ask a, a couple of deeper questions, like what does valuing family really mean? Um, what does value, if, if I say family um, is a value, then how, do, how, do, how does exactly that look? And, and how, how do I um, take my family and, and how does it fit in with my other priorities? Also looking at um, our should versus our wants. So shoulds normally show up when we're trying to um, satisfy what society thinks we should be doing instead of wants that's really more comes from the heart. So we've looked at the inner life now. So now we're going to be aligning step two, which is our outer life with our inner life. So now that we've got this framework or this sort of guidelines that we're working from, now we can say, okay, now we can make decisions because we've got the space. We know exactly what our inner life looks like to align our actions with that. So we're making clear decisions there, and which is not vague because we know where we're coming from. 
So once we've made these clear decisions, now we can be fully committed. Um, so instead of, of changing around and, and deciding um, a couple of weeks down the line that um, when things get hard, um, we should stick to our commitment. And then always be open for change. So now that we've decided we've committed to something, we should always evaluate and see what is working in my life, what's not working and how I can change that. So by now you've sort of have a good idea um, why integrity is so important. But just two things that I want to highlight is it's so important for personal growth, because as you've seen and what, what I've shared with you is that uh, these guidelines forms like a sort of a base from where we work from. So these, these, the, the inner life that we've identified is sort of our North Star. So we know that we're working towards that. Um, another thing that's important uh, to have integrity is if we, it's important to, to have integrity in order to have a, a overall well being. So we'll have then a healthy mind, body, and, and spirit. So if we have positive thoughts that would lead us to, to take positive actions, have positive emotions, and then uh, go and do what our mission is, go and do what our purpose in life is, and we're using our physical body to do that. So um, our body being an asset to us, our body having energy to allow us to do all those things. So just in closing, you know now, um, maybe I've given you a different perspective on, on integrity. You know how to get uh, closer to a life um, of integrity. And then lastly, you know why it's important. So um, hopefully you can take this information and integrate it in your life and, um, and see which areas in your life maybe you are not um, living close to your, to your, to your nature. So um, that's all from me today. And thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Norma. Uh, yeah, that was, that was amazing. And it's funny that today what I'm going to be doing with my team has got a lot to do with that. I hope you can hear the hearty does in the, in the background. Um, but yeah, so really exciting. And it's, Martha Back is also somebody that I only got to learn about in this week. So uh, thanks to you, actually. I think you sent me a video. Uh, on the weekend and it was amazing to, to, to watch that and think about that. So I'm so glad that you shared this with everybody. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, we'll see you back next week. Great. Thank you. Bye everyone. Awesome stuff. Bye bye. All right. So uh, then it's on to the featured topic for today. And as I said, I'm going to be sharing seven books with you that will impact your life in a positive way. And these books are by no means my top seven books or the only seven books. But there are seven books, and I, and, and I tried to sort of get something, and you'll see, it's, it's, although I try to focus on what will impact your life in a personal capacity, that is only a small part of it. Um, it, it there's also more to this. So there's also some things that may be useful in your practice, in your business, but it's not business orientated. It's got a lot to do with who you and I need to be and the skills that we need and things, you know, how our mindsets and how we need to think about things. And these seven books have really, really had a profound impact on the way that I view things, how I think about them. And therefore, I think that they will be extremely valuable to you to also have a look at. So with that, let's get into the featured topic. Yeah, so I'm not sure if you can see my my cook. Can you let my cook in? So um, this is not a like a, this is not real flowers. These this is all sugar. So as you saw, I'm at the FBI, which is the uh, Food and Beverage Institute. As I said before, uh, I don't know if I even mentioned that, but uh, yes, that's what the FBI stands for, and uh, it's the FBI Chef School in North Riding. And very happy to be hosting uh, my team from work here uh, today, and we're going to do some fun things and learn a lot together and grow together. But apart from that, the venue is stunning. The service is absolutely amazing. And what we're going to be doing later on is doing a bit of MasterChef challenge. So as you know, I love, 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 love food. And that's what we're going to do later on. So very excited for that. But uh, so maybe hopefully by now you wish that you were also here. Um, anyway, so let's get started uh, with the, the first book. And these are not 
in order of sort of my rating in which one of these seven books are the best. I'm just going to start at a point and share with you each and every book has got its own its own value and its own place uh, and so forth. So, so let's get started. The very first book that I want to share with you is, and you can write this down, is The One Thing. Uh, the book is called The One Thing. It's by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, but there's sort of three things, three main concepts that are being dealt with in this book that I, the first one is so simple and it does so much to help you and I just do things better and be more focused. Uh, but this one thing alone, you know, sometimes you think like if I only know this, I can put down the book and I don't need to read anything further or I don't need to know what's, you know, what the authors are saying uh, apart from this very first thing. But you really go through the entire book. Now, I didn't read it, by the way. Let me just be, be very clear about this. Like I listened to the book. That's what I do when I travel or when I'm in the car. Uh, or I really have nothing to do. I would put on my earphones and then listen to books. So I listen to audiobooks on Audible. So I go check it out, audible.com. And, um, and, and this is sort of, so I listen to this book specifically. But there are, there are three things that are very important here when it comes to the one thing. The very first thing is obviously that you can really manage a lot of things in your life and be much more focused by asking one simple question which i think is so apt because you need to ask one question for the one thing uh, so i think it makes complete sense to me and uh, this question is what's the one thing that i can do such that by doing it everything else will become easier or unnecessary and this is really based on the principle of of 80 20 the Pareto principle that you think about you know like uh, what is the, the one thing? So the 20% is going to give me 80% of my results. But it also goes a little bit further than that. So one can ask this question on two different levels. The one is that you can ask it on a macro level, and I sound like Gary Vaynerchuk right now, so on a macro level and a micro level. But if I can give you some examples. So let's just say, for example, um, you uh, the, the goal is to, to, to drive a car. Uh, down to Cape Town. I always use that example. I don't know why. But you want to drive down to Cape Town. That's the idea. So the question is, what is the one thing I need to be able to do that? And I guess the simple answer to that would be, well, for answer, you need a license. Because without a license, you know, you won't be able to do that in the first place. So that is the one thing that I need to do in order to get to Cape Town. But what do we do? We get stuck in Oh, I need a plan, I need to, to have a schedule, I need to have an itinerary, all those kind of things. That's the stuff that we get stuck in and we spend so much time there when in fact without a license you're not going to get there. Now probably when we start planning these things, yes we already have our license, but I'm trying to illustrate a point here, so please bear with me. So on a micro level, one would, needs to say the difference between macro is what do I need to do, so I need to get a license. On a micro level, what you would do is to say, well, what can I do right now and that is sort of what is the first step what is the thing i need to do right now because i can't just rock up to checkers and buy my license right there's a process so the first thing i probably need to do is to get some form of lessons or somebody to take me and teach me how to drive and uh, maybe the first step is to buy my the book that i can do my learners with uh, etc so so that is sort of the, the first thing and, and now that we know well what is this one thing on a macro level you basically break it down and say, well, what is the thing I need to do right now? Once you've done that thing, you ask the same question. Now I've gone for lessons. What do I need to do right now? Well, I need to book my appointment to, well, first need to do my learners probably. So make an appointment. That's the next thing. Go write the exam is the next one. Once I've passed, then I need to practice more. And then I need to go for the actual test. And then once I've done that and I pass that, then I'll get my license. So that's the macro versus the micro level. So these things are quite easy. And if you know what that one thing is and what the one thing is you can do right now, you focus on that. But here's the thing now. So that doesn't really mean much unless uh, we're able to say no. So if you want to be able to really focus only on getting the license, then you have to say no to a lot of other things. And that is really the hard part. It's not easy to just say no, because we all think that there's these important things or these urgent to do things that we always need to be doing. There's always something that is, if you know what you need to focus on and the one thing that you need to do to make it happen, then 
It should, in theory, be easier to say no, but it is not. So that's the second part that the authors are talking about in this book. The third one, in which is very important to me, I don't know, like I said a million times, like in, in, when I turned 45, it was like as if a switch flipped in my head and certain things came into perspective and things became more important that wasn't important before or not as important uh, or I thought that I prioritized it, but I in fact did not. So the third thing is to never, never, and they're very clear about this in the book, to never sacrifice your personal life for work. So never sacrifice your personal life for work. Um, and there's sort of three things that they, that, they, that they discuss here. The first one is the importance of your relationships, whether that's with one with yourself, then your spouse, your children, immediate family, and then so on and so forth. So that's important. And then also the highlight, the one thing that I'm really struggling with is sleep and health. So getting sufficient sleep and then also looking after your health. So those things need to take priority above your work. But what do we all do? because we feel like we have this responsibility that we have to provide and we have to serve and we have to help and we have to be there for everybody else, that if I get time, I will look after my health or I will go to bed early or I'll go to bed at the same time every night. So ask me, I've been doing this for many years. I'm an expert in not looking after myself. So, um, so that's the one thing. And then when you are working, you should be focusing on the one thing because you'll be more effective and you'll get more done that way. So I just want to go back and say, well, if you look at the saying no part, the one thing is that you should actually try and make yourself unnecessary. You should remove yourself from the equation. And there's, there's sort of, I think, three ways to do that. Um, the first one is that you could delegate or outsource. You could do that. Um, the, third, or the second thing is to see what you can automate. Like if somebody asks you the same questions over and over and over again, Create a FAQ, create a frequently asked questions that you can actually uh, just make available and point people to so you don't have to answer those same emails over and over and over again. So we need to start thinking, how do I remove the necessity for me to be involved in anything that you do apart from that one thing? And then um, the last thing I would say just, is it really necessary to do this thing in any event? So, so just get rid of it completely. All right, so that's the first book, The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan. Then the second one is a very old book. Uh, well, I say very old. I think it was written in 91 or 95. I can't remember. But what I do remember distinctly is that I was listening to this audiobook. In 2011, I was traveling to Bloemfontein every single week. Uh, so on a, I went there on a Monday, came back on a, on a Friday, and I did that for about six months. And so I had a lot of time because it's about a three hour drive, three and a half, maybe four hour drive from Krugersdorp to Bloemfontein and obviously back. So I had lots of time to listen to audiobooks in the car, and which I did. And one of the first ones that I listened to was by Tony Robbins. And this book is called Awaken the Giant Within. And there's some interesting things in there. And I think many of these things are not new to us by now, you know, at the time. It was amazing to hear these things, and it was like, oh, I've never thought of it this way. Now, everybody has put their spin on this in the last few years uh, or since then. So obviously, everybody's got different angles to it. And, and that's what I always say, you know, there's certain principles in life. Those principles have probably been discovered, and people are trying to make them applicable to the situation that they find themselves in at the moment. And for that reason, they... Uh, you know, we have different ways of saying the same thing, which is great because sometimes I say something and somebody won't get it, and then somebody else says the same thing but with a different story, a different example, or in a different way, just using one or two different words, and suddenly it clicks. So it's very valuable. But uh, some of the things that Tony Robbins talked about is to, like, if you have some bad habits, you need to associate that bad habit with pain so that it's hurting you, it's uncomfortable. That's what you, you sh there should be an association with that. And even though he goes so far as to say, well, you should do something that actually hurts you when you're doing a bad habit. Uh, like if I'm eating too much, um, you know, I think the example there was like, if you, if, you, if you eat too much, then, you know, you should just belt out a song that you hate or something, whether you're in a, in a public place or not, um, because you only do that once. So I don't know how powerful that is because I think I'm too shy. I won't sing in public anyway, uh, even if it, if it was good for me to do so. But um, that's the one thing. And then obviously good habits should be linked to pleasure. And I even think that Norma, maybe I've touched on these uh, before as well, um, but this is a method that you can use to break bad habits. But also then what is important is that you need to then 
replace that bad habit with a new good habit. And uh, we've spoken about this as well in the seven habits um, to build a legendary practice. That webinar that we did that's available on Circus Online, I also spoke about it there. Then uh, the second thing that Tony talks about is the, to change the words you use to transform how you feel and then deal with problems. So you guys say that the way you describe how you experience the world is a big and defining part of that experience. So when something goes wrong and you go like, ah, oh, blah, blah, blah. You know how we react to these things. Um, you know, it's that way. Or you could react in a different way, which I'm going to try now. Again, after just reviewing all these things, I'm thinking like, you know, maybe I should just go, that's unfortunate. <laughs> that's, that, that shouldn't have happened. You know, and just tone it down a little bit. Because the impact of our words have a significant impact on how we feel. And you know that how we feel has a significant impact on how we act. So that's, uh, that, that's some of the important stuff there. Um, it's very interesting that in the English language, uh, there are 3,000 words that describe emotions. So 3,000 words. 2,000 2, of them, or two-thirds, are related to negative emotions. So it's easy to go that route and then have a negative emotion connected to that because two-thirds of the language available to us is connected to the negative. So very important to focus on the way that we react and, and what we say. And then the third point that, that Tony makes is to make up your own rules and then communicate them to others because this is about accountability, I guess, but it's also about making clear about how you view things and, and, and what you want and don't want and what you like and don't like because it gives the other person who you're communicating it to the opportunity to do the same. And then, you know, maybe somebody thinks it's okay that you only speak on your birthdays with each other, uh, whereas the other person thinks like, yes, you're a bad friend because I think we should be talking every month. But if you're not communicating those things, then, you know, we would just move on with our perceptions and we don't get to common ground. So that's important uh, from that point. Um, then the, 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 the next book is a very exciting book. It was published, I think it was last year. It may, it may have been the end of 2019. It's somebody that I follow on YouTube. Um, they've got a, ch a channel called Valuetainment uh, for, for business. That is the best channel that I think that you can actually watch. Um, because the way that Patrick Bed David explains things are great. They've now also got many different people presenting different segments and things. Um, but he's built a sizable life insurance agency in the U.S. in a market that was previously there was nobody that really worked in that market. You look at the average kind of advisor there, it's the same as here, the 56-year-old white male. I almost said bald white male, um, but that baldness has got nothing to do with it. But that is what the, what the average advisor looks like over there. If you look at the agency, and they've got, I think, about 15 or 16,000 agents right now, it is a 36-year-old Latino woman. So it's a completely different business that they've built and extremely successful. Patrick himself is, is an Iranian, uh, Iranian, so they fled from uh, uh, Iran uh, back when there was war. They moved to Germany, stayed in a camp there, and then uh, his parents uh, was able to bring them to the U.S., so he's got a whole story that, that goes around that. But what I really love is that he takes this concept of a chess grandmaster or grandmaster, I don't know, was it, grandmaster. Um, if you want to be seen as that, it means that you are able to see at least five moves ahead. That is what makes you, you can already see five moves that's going to happen before the opponent even sees that. And they say that the really good chess masters can see 15 moves ahead. Now imagine being able to predict what's going to happen in 15 moves, or you know exactly what you're going to do, where and why, and then get the result that you're actually looking for. So this book, I've listened to the, to the, um, to the audiobook. I have bought the Kindle version. I've, I've read part of it. I've listened to it for a second time. Because there are five moves that he believes that uh, you need to do to win in business. And I'm just going to quickly share them with you. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, if you go and, and Google for this, you'll find a lot of summaries around this. But the first one, and this is something I actually said the other day in a session that we had, is that you have to start with yourself. If you're not okay, if you're not the best version of yourself, if you don't have the skills that you need, it's, you're only going to reach a certain level of success in your business. 
And that success looks different for everybody. For every business, it's different. For some, it's absolutely money-driven. For others, it's something completely different. But this is an important one. You master knowing yourself. Um, so that's, that's important uh, to know and understand that. The second move that you need is to master the ability to reason. How do you process issues and have a methodology for making decisions? Often we don't. We, we, we love going with our gut. Now, I'm a big proponent of going with your gut with decisions because often you will feel that it's the right decision to make. But sometimes when things are not clear cut or you don't have that feeling, what is your process for making decisions? So these are things that he discusses uh, in, 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 in move two. Move three is master building the right team. Now, I had a, I had a very um, revelationary morning this morning when I, when I arrived here at the FBI Chef School, and it was a teaching moment right in that second at quarter past six this morning. And what happened was that I got here, came in, greeted everybody, and I'm so used to doing every single thing myself. So I carry my gear, I carry my laptop, all the stands, the audio setup, everything that needs to travel with me, I'm used to doing all that stuff myself. I've been doing it since school when I, had, when I was a DJ. That's what I've done. I've done every single thing myself, and I don't expect anybody to help me because I'm responsible. And then I go back from the venue to the car, and as I look up, there's like two, two chef students standing there, and I'm like, yeah? <laughs> no, they, they, they're there to help me carry things, and it was two ticks and everything was here in the venue and I could start setting up. And in that moment, I realized again that oh, you can't do this alone. Like we can't, we can go only so far if we do it all by ourselves. We need help, you need people to make it easier. We need people to help us save time, to help us focus on that one thing that I spoke about earlier. What a moment, so, so, so grateful and blessed to have experienced that this morning because that was so in my face it was actually uncomfortable i felt so so uncomfortable but anyway so so that's the other thing then move number four is to master strategy so that you can scale so we need to master strategy so that we can scale and uh you know again there's so many things that he shares on his on his on, on their youtube channel that if you take those things and you start implementing one thing here one thing there You'll start to learn and see how it works in practice. So really, really make use of that. Um, but it's important because you're not just going to, to grow your business. There needs to be a plan. So, so you need to master strategy. And then move number five is master making power plays. Because obviously, if, you, if you're scaling, you're growing, now you're in a position where you can make power plays, whether that means acquiring another FSP, merging, whether it means whatever it may mean to you. Um, maybe bring in more financial advisors or maybe bring in more product lines or even niche down. Uh, that could also be a power play. So those are the kind of things that you could consider uh, and things that you could do. And the most important thing about this book is that you have to go from move one to two, from two to three, from three to four, from four to five. You can't start with making power moves unless you know yourself, unless uh, you have the ability to reason, unless you have a team behind you, unless there's a strategy. So all of these things go in sequence, so very important. So definitely check that out. Your next five move, uh, moves uh, by Patrick Bet David. Then uh, the, what is this now? The fourth one is uh, called, and, and this is the one book that David also shared, David LaRue, on the LinkedIn uh, comments. He said that The Power of Now is one of the books as well, and that's what Eckhart uh, Tolle, and that was quite interesting um, because basically the essence of this book i'm not going to go into too much detail with this book but basically what he's saying is that you know there's no point in living in the past there's no point living in the future we've all heard this the only time we, we can be really present and that we even have control over is right this second but what we tend to do is either hang on to things in the past things that have that are not we can't do it's, it's gone it's it's gone by it's not there anymore it's not going to happen it has already happened can't do anything. The only thing I have control over is about what I do right now. The same with the future. So, and he talks about it's only a series of present moments. So the past is in the past. The future is a series of, of moments that still needs to happen or that still needs to arrive. But the present, it's here. And I think Tanya Kunzo also spoke about this in one of the, the talks that I saw her give about this specifically, is that you have to focus on right now. Um, so that, that's important. So I'm not going to really go into, into too much of this. Um, one of the things that he does talk about as well is 
all the pain that we feel, the frustration, the hurt, the, the, you know, those kind of things is a result of resistance to the things that we cannot change. So we don't want to accept the fact that we can't change things that has happened. But then it, that resistance, it causes us pain. So you have to let go. You have to say, you know what, I can't do anything. It doesn't matter how you grew up. There's no, no, like, it should not, and I know it does, because what happens to us in our youth has the most significant impact probably on us than anything that happens at any other time in our lives, because we don't always have the, 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 the sort of the ability to process those things and understand and choose to think differently about them. But we're now grown up, so we do have that ability, and we can make those changes. It doesn't mean that it just goes away and disappears, but you can have a, a deep sense of peace, at least, you know, if you, if you make those kind of decisions. Um, so, yeah, and, and then the other thing is that you need to constantly be observing your mind. You have to think about what you are thinking <laughs> and saying to yourself internally. You have to be aware of that. Um, so he talks about that in that book. So definitely a book that I, that I would uh, recommend for you to read as well. Then the last three books I've actually got here, I've got the physical books. The first one is Tanya Kunze, uh, The Power of Positivity, and what is quite cool, if you may see there. So Tanya has written uh, me a little message. She says, uh, may your podcast go from strength to strength, and signed by Tanya Kunze. Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, she handed this to me in person, so that was quite special. Um, but what I like about this book is that it talks about, are you conscious? Or are you programmed? So think about that question for a second. Are you conscious or are you programmed? And um, that's an important sort of question, I think, to consider and to think about and to say, well, am I just acting because I've been programmed that way? Or again, so it's about self-awareness. Am I aware about what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, why am I saying this? Those kind of things. And it doesn't mean that we need to overthink everything because that's the other danger. So, so we wouldn't want to go uh, down that, that road. So some of the things about this book that I really, really love is that she takes um, scientific, so she takes a scientific perspective as well as a, a psychological perspective. And then she combines that. So, so there's, there's three minds that she talks about, or three bodies that, that she talks about. And um, she there talks about this and how your programmed thoughts, because remember, if it's programmed, it means that we do it automatically. We don't question it. It's just what we think immediately. Um, well, that plus then our energetic body, which is our physical body, I would, I would guess, um, impacts our physiology. So that's important, you know. Um, and this is all about, like, if I can relay this in my mind, the thing that I linked it to was immediately... What do I believe about things? Because what I believe about things immediately informs the way I think about things. So it influences my thoughts. If I believe something about someone or something, I'm gonna think about that someone or something in a particular way. The way I think about it is gonna create certain emotions and those emotions comes out through our actions, whether it's saying something, doing something, not doing something. So those are the important stuff here. And one of the things that makes this book so amazing is how she takes something from a neuroscience point of view and then uh, put it in layman's terms so that I can understand. Trust me, biology and science and those things were not my kind of subjects at school, but she makes it so, so easy. And the whole purpose of this book, um, or it's, it's structured in three ways. The one is to, uh, the first part would be, or for each chapter is, is, is uh, like this. So it is to shift your worldview. And then there's what science says about it. And then there's some practical exercises that you can go and do. So a very, very practical book that I really enjoy about that. My wife has been reading this book as well uh, for quite a while. It's why it doesn't look in such a good condition. Yes, wife, I know. Um, we had a chat about that last night. <laughs> but she says, when, I, when you use a book, it's not supposed to look neat. So yeah, I agree with you. Um, so then the second or the second last book is this one. I don't know if you've ever heard about Pepe Marie. Um, this is someone that I got to learn at one of uh, learn about at one of the SME Africa, uh, like when that was still around. Uh, Pepe spoke there, and I saw him at some other places as well. 
But he wrote this book called Growing Greatness. And this is the thickest of the books that I've shared with you today. Uh, but really amazing because this is Pepe's own story. And this is really structured into, into three parts. So he talks about the early days to sort of set the scene of how he grew up. Things like significant things that happened to him. And then from there it goes to the birth of Joe. Not, not his son. Uh, so what Pepe is, is uh, where he's involved is a, is a business called uh, Joe Public. They're one of the biggest, if not the biggest, I think they are the biggest advertising agency in South Africa. But they got to a point in 2006 or 7 where they felt like they, they were not going to make it. So that was the big thing. And there were certain things that he had to go through. And he talks about all of this and how they got to that one realization. And he gives the exact date when this happens, when this happened, and how it changed everything, and how they went from that position to becoming the biggest advertising agency in South Africa. So it's really a, 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 an inspirational story, something that I really, really uh, love about this. Um, the book starts off with a quote saying, and, and listen to this, though you can easily count the seeds in an apple, it is impossible, it is impossible to count the apples in a seed. And it says unknown, so nobody knows who said that, but that person was very, very wise. So definitely a book that I would recommend. Specifically what I enjoyed is the third part, the growth lessons, because he goes into, like, how does he structure a plan for 25 years? Then his year, month, like, breaks it down to daily things. And balance of life. So really, really amazing. So go check it out. Growing Greatness, a journey towards personal and business mastery. And then uh, the last book that I want to share with you. I've spoken about this on some of my webinars. I've spoken about this on, on the podcast. I think I may have spoken about this on the show as well. It is the book Acta Non Verba. Uh, it's by a guy called Eric Kreer. Also I got to learn about Eric at one of the SME Africa events. Uh, in fact, the very first one, and I was so intrigued. He was talking about procrastination. And uh, <laughs> me and my friend Vainant, we were like... <laughs> You know, going like, mm, yeah, that's us. Um, so, so that was the big thing. And, and this is the book that got me in 2018 when I was like, I thought to myself, shit, I, it can't go on like this. Uh, every year I get to September, October, business dries up. There's no money or cash flow. It's not no money, but there's no cash flow for three months. Uh, I can't go on like this. The stress, uh, the effect of that on me, the way I worry about it, it's just not good for me. So I don't want this anymore. And I started reading this book. And what makes, makes this book so phenomenal is that it's not a book that you pick up and you read over a weekend. There are 160 reflections in this book because uh, what Eric did is he, he had a project called Better Man. And he started this daily email. And the first email went out to four people, of which one was his girlfriend, getting a Better Man email. And uh, he then, after some good feedback, started promoting this. And he grew that very quickly to about 15,000 subscribers. And he used to write a reflection for Better Man every single morning and then send it out to this distribution list. And 160 of those reflections have then been put into this book. And uh, what's amazing is that you read one uh, on a day. So you take one reflection a day, you read it, think about it, it goes with you for the day, you leave this on your bedside table, and uh, it's very easy. Six months, you're done with the book. So very, very easy to do that. It's very short, it's usually one page, sometimes a page and a half, very, very easy to do. But the one thing that he talks about in here is the principle of accretion. And the principle of accretion I've spoken about quite a few times on the show and on my webinars as well. This is the act, this is like, he compares it to a snow, snowball. When it starts off, it's small, it starts rolling slowly down the hill and it picks up more snow, you know, and sometimes it'll hit a, a tree or a stump or, some, or a rock or something and it just, it's gone. But if it goes on long enough, the more it goes, the more snow it picks up, the bigger it becomes. It builds up momentum. And so this whole principle around accretion is that if you add skills and habits all the time, just a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit master them, a little bit at a time, that you become this unstoppable force is the way that I like to think about it. But that's the one principle from, from this book. And there's quite a few others in here as well. So definitely something that you go and check out. I think all of these books uh, are available on Amazon, as a, on, on, but you'll be able to get them on Kindle, the South African ones as well. And uh, I actually forgot I wanted to start off with the very first book I thought I would share with you, and that is Business Management. But that was only for a joke, because um, although it is important, um, it's not so, so uh, 
yeah, it doesn't fit into what I wanted to share with you today. Anyway, so uh, before I uh, go to the financial coaching segment, uh, please share some of the books that have had a significant impact on you, uh, maybe during lockdown, maybe before, maybe, and sorry for the planes and everything, it's not the most wonderful place for sound this, this morning, but um, yeah, what are the books that I've really, that you've read that I've had, I mean, even a book like Steve Jobs' biography for me is amazing to hear that story, but it's because I'm so interested in, in that kind of stuff. So it can be an autobiography that you read, it could be a self-help book, it could be any book that has, has sort of given you, even if it's the financial planning handbook, share that. They will be glad to hear that this has had a phenomenal impact on your life. Anyway, so with that, thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Hendra Crawford uh, for the financial coaching segment. Good morning to everyone that's on the show this morning and listening to all the wonderful inputs from Norma as well as Francois, what he shared. I got a few new books because I love reading, so he added some to my reading list this morning. So uh, just a few thoughts um, on financial coaching and... Uh, Specifically, we were starting off in our first discussion a little bit around uh, sustainable financial planning. And the principle that we started off in our last discussion was thinking of we've got a financial plan for our clients and then life will happen. So something will happen in their lives that will affect the plan or markets will move and clients will want to move differently in terms of their portfolios or the advice we gave them. We then said it will all depend on, firstly, how our clients is going to react on the event that happened in the, their lives or how, and it couldn't be, a, a, and or how we as financial planners is going to support our clients in terms of how they're going to react in terms and what actions they are going to take out of their financial plans. That will lead to sustainable financial planning if we make the right dec behavioral decisions in terms of supporting the advice and reacting on the event or markets that happens in their lives. So this morning I want to spend just a few thoughts in terms of what is the things that we as financial advisors can listen to that link to the behavior of our clients. And it's actually easy. There's three things that we need to listen to. But what do we first need to listen to? I think there's two main things that we need to listen to from a financial coaching perspective. The third is, first is, what is the mood of my client? So is my client stressed out, anxiety, in a space of resignation or in a space of resentment? Because that's a bad space and we know moods will influence the action we take. Or is my client in a mood of acceptance? or possibility and or oneness. So seeing what learning experience can I take from that? That's a much better space than to take action from. So we need to listen to that. The second part is the language my client use. And the most things, if we think from a behavioral viewpoint that we as humans will act from is specifically the assessments we make, and that's driven by our beliefs and our values, which Norma also talked about, the dreams we've got. So what is that judgments and assessments our clients are making? And then the other one is the assertion. So what is the cultural background and how I grew up? So if we then listen for that, then there's three things that we can listen for. The first is, what is my client's values? What is my client's personality? Uh, what is my client's view towards financial competencies and behaviors? Is my client a saver or is my client a spender? Is my client content with li life or are my client um, a goal-driven person? So that's the one cluster, the, my pers financial personality, I would call it. The second one is how do my client want to engage in terms, do my client want to delegate to me? Do my client want to take ownership of, of specifically of, my fi of their finances? Um, what is the style? Must I give it a lot of detail to my client or just sum it up in bullet points? The last one is how do my client think about the risk? How do, what is my knowledge? What is the knowledge of my client? And how will my client 
act and stay with the advice that I gave. So that's the three clusters. So in close, closing then, how do we listen to mood? How do we listen to language? And then think about my client's personality, their communication styles, and how they think about investments will influence. And that's also how do I think as a financial planner. So good news. Be here next week, Friday, because um, Robin Clay from Adida Money EQ Personality will take us on a journey in terms of the tools she have as a business that can support us specifically fast forwarding this process so that we can much easily understand our and have a over to you Francois Cool beans. Thank you very much, Hendrik. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. So next week's guest is uh, Robin Clay from Horida. And we're going to be talking about money EQ. You may have seen some of the posts going around on LinkedIn and so forth. A phenomenal tool. Really excited to see what it's all about and to learn more with you about this. And also going to have Hendrik as part of that session to also discuss his practical experience from using this with clients and what, is, what, what the reactions are and what they're seeing. So definitely something not to miss. It will be our featured topic next week. And with that, Hendrik, thank you so much. I have you, hope you have a fantastic weekend there in the Free State. Um, and uh, we'll chat soon. Thanks, Francois. Thanks to everybody that listened this morning. Awesome. All right. Um, so, yeah, with that, we've come to the end of the show this morning. And I want to thank you very much for your time and uh, for being here with us this morning. Really excited for what lies ahead. There's a whole host of things happening over on Propulsion Pro. So a lot of events, challenges, and CPD and learning going on there, uh, and, and, and really, really amazing what we built there. I'm so happy to say that we've got our 31st member already. <laughs> so we've doubled what Ignite used to be, so that's amazing. But uh, we just keep on growing. Every week there's, there's two or three people coming into the community, and I'm really, really thankful for that. I'm so happy that people are seeing the value. Uh, they are usually ask, you know, what made you join? And the feedback I'm getting, it really, really warms my heart. And uh, But that doesn't mean that we've, we've made it in the sense of like we know what to do or we know exactly what you need or what you want. So we really want to encourage those that are, are part of uh, Propulsion Pro, or even if you're not and you have some ideas around it that would make it more valuable and even get you to join, let me know. Um, I'm quite keen to, to learn and to see how we make that the best community, not only in South Africa, but globally. And uh, what's also amazing is that we're working together with guys like Next Gen, with Adam Owen and his team, and then also Kate Holmes. Uh, we do a lot of work with her as well. And uh, yeah, so, so really bringing some amazing things. And on that note, <clears throat> the uh, I'm going to put down in the, 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 the description, the global conference or the, the global financial planning conference tickets is available. Um, so the normal price for uh, for members of these communities are 100 pounds, um, which is including that. I, I, well, not including that. I think it's excluding that. But um, for Propulsion Pro members, there's an even more discounted uh, amount, and that's only 50 pounds plus that. So it works out 60 pounds. It's about 1,200 rand that it'll cost members of this community. If you're not a member, the fee is 6,000 rand uh, to, to attend. So it's 250 pounds plus VAT. It's about 300 rand, uh, or 300 pounds rather, to attend. And uh, But for our members, you get it heavily discounted. So even if you're not a member and you decide to join, you're still going to save. Like um, if you pay for a full year's membership and you pay for that, you're still better off than just paying for the conference. So please uh, check it out. It's going to be the biggest uh, conference in the world. There's over 100 speakers at this event over three days, and we're really looking forward to, to that. So join us for that. A lot to learn uh, for, for, for that. Anyway, more information. I'll be sending out WhatsApps, emails, and uh, putting it on our website and also in the descriptions below. So uh, And you can go check it out and see what to expect and what it's about, and also to book your tickets uh, because it's early, but there's only 100 of them available for early birds. So go check them out. On that note, thank you so, so much for being with me here at the FBI. And also, I have to say to Chef Nicholas and Chef Shaw, thank you so much for, one, welcoming me here and allowing me to be able to broadcast from here so early. So when I got here at quarter past six, I thought, yeah, shame, these people need to get up. I got here, they were already busy in the kitchen. It's crazy. So I'm still like, I'm still a late sleeper. But anyway, thank you so much to them. They've got a fantastic venue. I'm really looking forward to spend the day here. But for them to accommodate me to 
be able to broadcast from here is absolutely amazing. So thank you. They didn't have to do that. I will see you back next week, same place, same time. Stay safe. Have a fantastic weekend. I love you. Bye-bye.